the live debate. IntelligenceSquared.com I love my washing machine. It's a phrase you don't often hear. Why do people get so fanatical about bicycling? People get fanatical about bicycling because it allows us to experience all our human potential all at once. First, the effort involved puts you directly in touch with your animal identity. A keyboard jockey who rides to work gets the voluptuous appetite of a ditch digger without going anywhere near the gym. If the big switch turns off tonight, no electricity, no pipe water, no sewage disposal, humans might not go extinct, but our numbers will soon thin out. We are animals, we are also, in our multitudes, products of industry. Colloquially, people talk about learning to balance a bike, but discovering the trick of staying up on two wheels is the exact opposite. A bicycle only balances when leaning on something. In use, it's falling. The only thing balanced are the forces. The trick of falling without falling down is not learning to balance, it's getting used to not being balanced. A bicycle's dynamism is the perfect metaphor for modernism, where nothing ever stays the same. Riding a bicycle is the apotheosis of machine life. On a bicycle, you become the biological element of a cyborg system. Alfred Jarry called it the mineral skeleton that will allow us to outstrip evolution. It's not natural, it's as far from nature as you can get. Riding a bike gives you instant contact with your identity as a biological system and an industrial product. There's also an important spiritual element. Riding from here to Paris is no big deal. Elephant and Castle, Croydon, New Haven for Dieppe, through Seine Maritime, across the Vexin, Seeing the Eiffel Tower rising over the horizon compares to queuing at St Pancras and sitting on a train as home cooking compares to pot noodle. Being an airline passenger is like eating toothpaste. <laughs> but you have to choose it. The hardest part of any bike journey is the idea. The rider's most important quality, good morale. Traveling at a comfortable pace is not an athletic achievement, it's a triumph of the will. Then there's the social element. Atmospheric resistance rises with the third power of velocity. Simple physics mean that two people cooperating can keep moving with significantly less effort than a soloist. Ride a bicycle and you're an animal, a machine, a soul, and a potential comrade. A fulfilled modern human, an ubermensch. Riding a bicycle is democratic. Not like playing the violin, you don't need to be gifted. Ride a bike and you get better at riding a bike. The more you ride, the better you get. The practical pneumatic tire dates from around 1890. The automatic freewheel, the last element of the modern bicycle, became available in 1898. In historical terms, that was yesterday morning. In evolutionary terms, a blink. This is the pioneer era of pedal cycle use. We are only scratching the surface of its potential. Riding a bike in England in the last third of the 20th century meant, meant being part of a vanishing tribe, a vanishing tribe that was stubbornly refusing to vanish. If you spoke to a politician, a planner, or a traffic engineer on the subject of cycle travel, you could be certain that the first sentence of their reply would contain one of the following words, safety, risk, or danger. Suggesting that people might use bikes to conveniently fulfill their daily agendas was about as sensible, sane, and mainstream as advocating mass use of magic carpets. Now, we're into the era of mixed messages. Travel by bike and you may be treated like a heroine or hero. Also, still, you may be treated like vermin. The fantasy among our rulers that bicycling would wither away to nothing has been superseded. They've recognized the value of cycle use, that the bicycle is a solution to a raft of problems. Global warming, motor traffic congestion, and the elephant in the room, the public health time bomb of sedentary living. Like all sensible people, they look forward to bicycling catching on with ordinary folk. 
Their new fantasy is that these people will take up traveling by bike, but remain unchanged by the experience. That normal people will ride bikes and stay normal. <laughs> this cannot be. People who ride bikes become happier, more optimistic, more self-reliant, less fearful, less governable. Mao Zedong remarked that revolution is not a dinner party. The old authoritarian was right. Revolution is not a dinner party, but it might be a cycle tour. <laughs> How can we make ourselves more infectious to the bicycle deficient majority? How can we intensify the epidemic spread of bicycle madness? Our simple, pleasant obligation is to be good role models, to make our travel look easy, stylish, enviable, aspirational. I'm definitely not asking you to take cycling seriously. One of the many beautiful things about cycling is that it's not serious. On a bike, even the most irksome journey can generate a childlike thrill, but it's powerful. Powerful enough to be worthy of consideration. Time spent thinking about how to do it is never wasted. Warning. When someone tells you this is how to ride a bike, what they almost always mean is this is how I ride a bike and it works for me. If they're a person you can identify with who finds satisfaction in their travel, it's sensible to suck up their wisdom. But it's their wisdom. No matter how inexperienced you may be, you're the expert on your own life. It's up to you to work out what style or styles of riding best fulfill your needs. Bicycling is much too new to have developed a classical form. There are principles, there are no rules. People fear freedom. A common response to the untested potential of this pioneer era is retreat into dogma and sectarianism. You can ride to the opera house with every grain of foundation, every eyebrow hair in perfect order. You can dress in fluorescent, fluorescent sportswear, then endeavor to cover 40 kilometers in 55 minutes. These are both examples of real cycling, both demonstrations of control. Make your riding look easy, or if you, don't, if you want it to be challenging, no harder than you want it to be. Never fight with a bike until you've engaged the lowest riding gear. Let the machine do the work. The consumerist element of riding a bike is delightful, as if you could go to a shop and buy a pair of Usain Bolt legs. But cycling is not a consumerist activity. Where you're going, who you're going with, what you're going to do, see, and eat when you get there are all more important than what you ride. Enjoy cycling, but don't love your bike. Ride it, maintain it, adapt it to your needs, get another one if necessary. The first will never become jealous of the second. Save your love for those who can love you back. <laughs> if you treat a modern aviation grade bike designed primarily for Americans to ride in the sunshine, like the bike your great grandfather rode to the mine, it will fail. Feed a racehorse on thistles and it doesn't turn into a donkey, it dies. It's not a moral question. Nobody goes to heaven for having a clean bike, but the people who invented and perfected the derailleur would be astonished at anyone starting a journey on a dirty bike. You don't have to use a machine exactly as its makers intended, but you do need to understand what it was designed for. If you're uncertain whether you really need a particular facility on a bike, leave it off. There's always an argument for minimalism. A puncture is not an emergency. It's what happens when you ride your bike, make contingency plans. Ride as if you own the road and are ready to share it generously with others. It can be tiresome to be treated as a problem when you're the solution to a problem, but don't let other people's stupidity upset you. Never take it personally. Those afflicted by motor dependence may drag us down towards their own unenviable position, but the primary victims of their misfortune are themselves. <laughs> Traffic is only other people. Almost all of them are nice people like us, but even the gangsters, the ones whose parents didn't love them enough, don't want, for their own selfish reasons, to run you down. 
Give them a chance not to run you down, and they won't. On a bicycle, you can take your place on busy roads amongst fast-moving motor traffic, sharing space with people who are literally 50 times more powerful than you is free assertion training. You can also move comfortably amongst the random patterns of pedestrian traffic. A different style is required when you become the element in the mix with most potential to threaten. It's not enough to keep other people safe. You mustn't even frighten them. If you're in a hurry, it's quicker and safer on the road. Our mission is to spread the courtesy and care of the park and footpath into the spaces currently dominated by the ill temper of motor traffic, not to contaminate motor free space with the brutal get out of my way, I could kill you manners of the highway. The target is a culture of consideration, not a culture of compliance. The 20th century tested the limits of the cheap energy economy. All the door to technologies of the bicycle that rely on external power are self-limiting. Modern motoring isn't freedom, it's the triumph of patience over imagination. People don't change their habits because they feel guilty. They change when they recognize a better way. The Stone Age didn't end because the cavemen ran out of stone. If I told you 10 years ago that one day the mayor of London would cycle to work and leave 10,000 bikes lying around the West End and city for anyone to ride, you'd have told me to take a cup of chamomile tea and calm down. The current challenge is to imagine what new madness the next 10 years will bring. Transport revolutions can happen very quickly. The time when human power, the pedal cycle, becomes the default mode of personal mechanical travel may be nearer than we imagine. Riding with Elan might hasten that bright morning. Even if it does, doesn't, the epidemiological evidence is very clear. People who ride bikes live longer. So either way, we increase our chances of being alive on that happy day. Thank you.